This is the video podcast for Chapter 3 of HYD 151, and the topic is Tackling New Frontiers in Science. What I've tried to do in this class is teach you the basic approaches that are necessary in order to measure all of the different water fluxes and storages that are present in the landscape. And we've seen things, of course, rainfall, runoff, infiltration, evapotranspiration, groundwater, flux, hydraulic head, matrix potential, and all that kind of stuff. Inevitably, though, you'll reach a point where you'll need to measure something for which there is no known method. Um, you may be tackling new mechanisms in hydrology, so how is water actually moving? Um, or you, know, you may be working in a setting that's just fundamentally different and requires new thinking. So how do you approach a situation like that? And the best way I can show you is uh, through my own experience in exactly going through that. Another thing is that I also want to use this as an opportunity to make a plea that hydrology isn't just in the service of trying to solve practical problems, although that's important, but hydrology is a science unto itself. And when I mean science, I mean something about which people are just fundamentally curious. And so whether there's any particular driver or not, on the basis of curiosity, you may be interested as a scientist in the future in making measurements and you need to be able to think freely and creatively um, in order to pursue how to do the field work to study what you want to study. And in my case, I had a particular interest because uh, I'm a lifelong whitewater kayaker um, I was born and raised near the Potomac River, uh, the Mather Gorge section. I, I grew up around water and rivers and, you know, always thought that they were there for uh, us to enjoy and as natural phenomenon. And, you know, as I matured intellectually, I came to understand that rivers are not a given, but they're something that require a huge amount of stewardship and preservation because they have been under such uh, dramatic change as a result of human activities. So I've always been interested in rivers and as a kayaker there's always been this phenomenon known as hydraulic jumps or in the whitewater community we just call them holes. So what is a hole? How does it work? And you can learn more about that in, in fluid mechanics um, but what one thing that's particularly notable when you look at whitewater of course it's called whitewater because as you can see in those photos it's white. So what role does whitewater play in rivers was just something that I was innately curious about as part of my own development as a scientist. And uh, thinking about this problem, uh, realized that there wasn't a lot of science out there to guide an understanding of it, especially for natural rivers, not necessarily for man-made structures, but uh, in a situation like is shown in these photos from the South Fork of the American River, um, you know, what is the nature of that white water? And white water is, is white because it's a mixture of air and water. So the question really comes down, you know, how much air is present in white water and, and what is it role? So white water is white because it's full of air and that means we're going to need to quantify the amount of air and water. This is something for which I had never seen anybody attempt to do uh, in the river literature and in fact what, had no idea how one would go about that. That's not to say that methods weren't out there, but uh, for this specific context I had not seen that developed. Um, I had seen things in the engineering literature with respect to uh, man-made structures, but the technologies that were used there were you know, poorly reported from the 1960s and um, it was impossible to see how they could be adapted for use in a setting such as shown in this photo where it's not just a really small hydraulic jump and a flume that you could just measure very easily. <clears throat> so the first thing I had was well what if we could just stab the river okay and I mean again you know ideas you know you can laugh that's okay um, I was laughing at the time too, but what is air content? It, you know, white water is a mixture of air and water. So, of course, remember from the lake presentation or from sediment coring, if you take a tube, you get it into the river, and you collect a sample, you could get a, could you get a sample of air and water and 
Of course, the relative amount of water in a tube would be the fraction of water content over that length. So if you had a long tube, you were in a raft over, over the river, you thrust this thing down in there, um, you quickly cap the top, you know, the cap creates the suction, and um, you would now have a preserved sample that you could try to bring out. Uh, that was the idea. Uh, of course, simple, cheap, seemed workable. So, you know, I always like to have uh, some kind of idea that fits that designation. But there were some major concerns as to the viability of this approach. First, just the, the danger of trying to stand in, in white water. How would you do this at different spatial scales? Um, well, of course, you'd be standing in a raft next to white water like a harpoonist on a whaling boat or something. Um, and, you know, are you going to be disrupting the flow pattern? How do you control the area that you're getting the sample from? How do you know its geographical position, the depth? How would you ever see the three-dimensional structure of the air content this way? So, you, know, you always start off with something, what's cheap and easy, and think about it some more. And I have to tell you that what actually got me to the right answer was um, my exposure here at UC Davis to soil scientists. Because soil scientists have another technology called time domain reflectometry. This is a technology that's used to measure the water content of soils, recognizing that soil has uh, a dielectric constant as a medium that's quite different from water when you put a signal through it. And so here's some TDRs. <clears throat> and uh, what happened is as I was learning soil physics myself as a young professor, um, I came to realize, you know, if TDR can be used to measure the water content in soils, and soil has a very similar dielectric constant to air, then why do we need the soil at all? What if we just put it in an air-water mixture and measure the, the air content. So I'm not interested in the water content, I'm interested in the air content. Would this work? So I got a graduate student, um, someone equally interested in white water and <clears throat> trained in hydrology, and we started to do some experiments. And indeed, if you, we figured out, like uh, we had to try a variety of different bubble chambers. This was one of our first bubble chambers, it wasn't my favorite, but you take a tube and let's say you, you um, fill the tube with half water and half air. Uh, of course, if you put a TDR in there, just in a still condition, you have a 50% air content and you could measure that right there. But we thought, well, we don't want to just have a situation where we have statically anywhere from 0 to 100% water. We'd like to see how this works in, in a, with, with a, a full mixture. So we, we used a fritted glass filter on the bottom, and if you, you could pretty much just turn on air from an, an, you know, an air vent in the laboratory, push it up through the filter, and create bubbles. So if you start with a 50-50 mixture of air and water static, and you turn on the bubbles and you bubble it up so that the bubble column is exactly filling the chamber, or, or the height of the TDR, then you can... Um, then you can, you can get a fully you know, turbulent air-water mixture, not unlike a hydraulic jump, that um, you could see how it would work. So we did a first calibration with a raw 30 centimeter probe, um, this one shown in the right here. This is a, a very early bubble chamber before we got some really good fritted glass uh, filters. And um, what you can see is that indeed there is a relationship between the signal coming off the TDR here in Hertz versus um, the air concentration in the left. So you could see that for, for air concentration of zero, um, there's a relatively small change in this. Let's see, uh, um, for, right. So we, we, you know, when, it, we, when it's predominantly water basically, the sensor does not have a high sensitivity, okay? Because the sensor is really designed to measure low water contents. So a value of one for air content would mean zero water content. And you can see that um, just by nature, um, a TDR is designed to measure water content in the zero to 30% range because you know, that's what soil scientists are interested in. So you have a wide range of values on the x-axis to resolve a relatively small range of concentration. So that's, that's very sensible. That's, 
where the main power of the sensor is. And then there's a, an abrupt transition where you have a relatively small range of sensor sensitivity to cover a wide range of air contents. So we decided to trick the system to improve its performance. We said, well, if it wants to have a low water content, how about if we put a piece of dry cell foam around it? And that will basically be like a soil. So we'll be significantly reducing the water content that way. And when we did that, we just have the 10 centimeter prong sticking out at the bottom. And admittedly, there's still some sensing detection taking place outside the foam because TDR has a, a longer area around it that's measured. But we're still significantly reducing what's being measured. And so when we did that, then we got this curve, which is a much more even calibration curve. It's not quite linear, but it, uh, it has a much greater sensitivity. Um, so, you know, a, 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 an improved sensitivity uh, in the range from 0 to 40% air content, and then uh, really even up to, uh, up to like a 65-70% um, air content. So we ended up using this structure here with the open circles and having our calibration between turbulent air and, uh, and the TDR response. So now we took this out in the field. Um, there in the upper South Fork of the American River. Our first attempt, so now the question is, okay, how do you get this thing out into the hydraulic jump? And so just, you know, don't forget that uh, field methods are one part sensor and sensor development and another part installation and uh, operation. And in this case, you know, here we have a fairly sizable hydraulic jump. It's, you know, a really nice looking uh, hydraulic jump probably with the jump toe, I'm sorry, with, with the, the jump pretty much aligned with the jump toe, so pretty close to ideal hydraulic jump condition. You can see a very high air content just visually. So how would we get it in here? And first we thought about trying to boat in here, surfing across with the sensor in, but the sensor has to be connected to this data logger inside this box. So we very quickly realized you don't want to be trying to surf a river with cables across that could wrap around your neck or cause other kinds of problems. So instead, we just bundled the whole sensor up with a whole bunch of flotation and just threw the thing out there, let it surf and, and bounce around <coughs> and collect data so we would get just as a first cut. And that led to this time series where we saw you know, uh, minimum air concentrations, I guess as low as 10%, an average of close to 40% and peaks that are relatively high. Now these peaks could be spurious because there are times when the, the prongs could have been flopping up in the air. I think we tried to filter some of that out. But um, you know you can see that for, as a first cut, air concentration is about 40% for surfing in the front of this foam pile here. That's pretty interesting. I mean, this is data that nobody in the world has ever attempted or seen before. So as a scientist, to me, that's really exciting. Like, you know, how hard is it to get out in the field and make a measurement that nobody has ever thought of or tried? And even more, do it by taking a technology that was developed for one discipline and applying it in a completely different one. I mean, this idea of, like, of cross-fertilization is so important. It's the idea that you, know, you could develop something for one reason and take it for something else. And so even though this work we're doing here is entirely curiosity driven, it leads to a whole range of applications of TDR that perhaps people hadn't traditionally been thinking about. And it also, you know, when you, when you look at air water mixtures, there's a lot of settings in which there are applications as well as basic science needs. So now we wanted to go to a more precise measurement, not just throw it out, but really start to understand the relationship between air content and hydraulic jump structure. To do this, we scaled down to a much smaller scale. And this is a good time to just mention by name that, that my PhD student working on this was Brett Valle, who is well known as a kayaker in the California community, and did this as part of his PhD, so I should you know, give him credit. So one of the things that we did is we started to map in incredibly high resolution the pattern of the topography of bedrock in a bedrock river. So this is a, a relatively small boulder. I know it's always hard to see for scale, but uh, I believe in, in this axis on the left, these are probably in units of meters to give you a sense of scale. So a really small site. 
um, and it has a hydraulic jump. And you can see that there are individual blocks of bedrock that are coming together, um, creating this feature. Um, then what we did, so, so basically we went to a site where we could go by hand and literally map the two-dimensional structure of air content in the hydraulic jump. Um, here's a map that shows water draped on top of the topography, so the flow is coming right at us out of the page, and there's some just vectors that are showing the direction of the water surface topography that's present here. They're not, they're not actual flow vectors, but assuming flow follows head, then, then it would be. And then on the right, with this fairly similar orientation, the light gray lines here show the contours of the bed topography, and then the black lines show contours of air content. And you can see that the peak air concentration wasn't right at the toe, but uh, it was just a little bit downstream of that, um, and it was up to 50%, and then it quickly dropped off again. So we have air contents between you know, 3% to 50%. Um, so now we have the actual structure of air content in two dimensions, which again, nobody has seen before. Now, at this point, we're talking about a very small hydraulic jump, you know, only uh, several meters, you know, five meters wide by five meters long, something like that. But we're showing that uh, the technology is working, we're getting interesting science, and now we can start thinking about how are we going to scale this up. And so now we had to think, well, what would allow us to get into unweightable hydraulic jumps? And we started to think about construction cranes a uh, construction crane you know, is, has a very different function, but basically it reaches out over something and allows you to raise and lower things over that other area. So we started with a very simple home brew, the idea of making a fairly robust tripod, putting a piece of truss along it, and then having uh, a suspension cable to go out, and then being back supported by tying off on the rocks. And again, we started off in a relatively simple context of just doing this um, in a weightable hydraulic jump, you know, very simple conditions and seeing what we would get. And, you know, this worked okay, but, it, you know, it sort of proved the concept. Uh, notice that along the truss there is a carriage, and you can see it really well in this photo on the right. There's a carriage that rolls along here. We can, uh, I guess we pull, yeah, pull a, uh, a cable to raise and lower a survey rod. And so we could accurately measure the bed topography and water surface topography. Now this is shown in a weightable spot, but it could also be used in a relatively small unweightable location as well. So then we said, okay, well, we have a proof of concept, but now we need to take this to another level. So we need to really work with mechanical engineers who really know how to build stuff. So we contracted out uh, well, I should also say that Brett and I went and got a National Science Foundation uh, grant, and that grant included a budget of $20,000 for the development of a robotic river truss that would really be professionally engineered. And I also had some money from my startup package as, as a professor to, to put into this too. So this was this is the, the conceptual, conceptualization of, uh, of a design where we, one thing we realized was like tying off to these back rocks was not working very well. The system needs to be entirely self-contained. And so uh, the idea would be to have a dramatically longer truss with counterweights on the back and then also weights on the tripod. But instead of weighing this down using actual like, you know, uh, built-in weights the way um, a, a commercial uh, crane would use, we figured, well, why don't we just use a pump and fill this with water from the river? So it'd be really simple, a simple electrical pump and use water weight to offset that. And we could also use little rocks too as, as needed for dynamic weight changes. So this is an entirely self-contained. It would be able to rotate in 365 degrees. We have a central a, a span to um, basically have multiple cables coming off of this to, to hold this. And then the idea would be to have a robot that would be able to drive out along here. It would be, it would have a, it'd be self-leveling, raise and lower this rod and take measurements. Um, so needless to say, the people that we were working with were equally ambitious and young and willing to try things that um, no one had ever tried before. Um, and as a result, you know, we, we really took some risks. We tried some things and 
uh, it was a big challenge. We had a lot of learning. I mean, like any time you invent something, there's a whole process there. And ultimately, it led to the, the, robot, the river truss. We ended up not going with the robot for a whole variety of reasons, uh, one of which is weight, another is just uh, a lot of challenges with, with self-leveling out above the river, and just using a much simpler manual uh, carriage out along the truss. But here's a photo that shows the truss. Um, looks like it's uh, hard to see. I think it's extended 30 feet forward and maybe 15 feet back in this photo. Um, and so here we are over a section of uh, the South Fork of the American River where it's definitely not weightable in the middle here. Um, although this isn't a particularly big flood or anything, but just again, testing it out for the first time. Um, you can see the tripod. The tripod is just fantastic. I mean, what a piece of machinery it is. Um, and the way that this is designed, you have a really long pole with a, a survey prism, and then separately we have a robotic total station for being able to map. So you can use the robotic river truss to map the topography of the bed and the water surface, and then ultimately to install you know, sensors and, and take time series of what's going on. Um, the, the biggest place where I've deployed the river truss was Longbow Falls in the South Santiam River. Um, here's a photo of a student from Oregon State University who was assisting me on my first sabbatical in this deployment. Um, now this waterfalls here is quite substantial. This is not one that you would want to have to swim through. Um, it's a fully submerged hydraulic jump uh, with potentially deadly conditions depending on where you were to go into it. And so with this setup, we really achieved the full potential where we use the river truss to map the full topography of the bed and water surface. And we also use it to deploy the TDR in here. And you'll see here, um, although it's bouncing around a little bit, you know, for the first time in history, making measurements of the air content in a natural um, hazardous waterfalls. So pretty exciting from my perspective over several years to begin with an idea, the river stabber, as stupid as that was, get to TDR, figure out how to deploy it, build this entire river truss system. In fact, we filed a patent and we're granted a patent for it, and then be able to come out to a river and begin to measure the dynamics of a real waterfalls. Another example, we deployed it in California on the Bear River. Um, there was a waterfalls there that Turns out it was, it's a man-made structure, but it was still a really interesting thing to go and study and look at the air content of. Again, this would be deadly if you were to try to swim through it. And you know we saw here air contents as high as 45% at the toe and then down to 30% to downstream. So we pretty much nailed the technology. We have the full capability to measure the air content in hydraulic jumps. And not only that, but we went from going from really small hydraulic jumps and little bed steps to full-size waterfalls um, and in real rapids and rivers. Now, this isn't something you're going to use in Niagara Falls, obviously. You know, I mean, you could always go get a commercial truss and take it out to the Grand Canyon or something. I mean, it's not like it's impossible. We've proved the idea of how one would go about this, and it, it's working. So to summarize with the air content, we found that hydraulic jumps and mountain rivers, they have an organized structure of air and water. The highest air contents can get up to 80%, but and when you average with a TDR, you're typically getting peaks of about 50%, and it's a little bit downstream of the step toe, and then air content decreases downstream from there. So from a basic science perspective, we answered the questions that we set out to you know, address, like what is the nature of whitewater? Now the next step one can say is, okay, well, so what? And the so what part could come in two aspects. It could come into the scientific so what, as in what is the role of air content and white water in say, causing geomorphic change or in ecological functionality, um, or it could be a so what and like, okay, how can we use this for the benefit of, of human understanding and design, a, well, specifically like design of structures and river restoration and I can tell you that all that is relevant. There's, there's definitely ways it comes into play. What I'll do to just illustrate is show the scientific so what, focusing more on hydraulics and geomorphology.
could we think of ways in which higher air content or fluctuating air content could promote scour and geomorphic change? And there's two broad ways in which this could take place. The first is that if you have an air water mixture and you have sediment moving down the river, when you have a grain the size of my fist and it goes over a step and it hits the bed at the bottom, even if it's a bedrock bed, it's going to do work. You have a hammer and you have hammers going 24 hours a day smashing into the bed. Over time, that's going to get work done. Now, what if the, um, the water at the bed is not just 100% water, but is a mix of air and water? What if it's up to 50% air? Well, the weight of that particle is substantially higher in air because there's no buoyancy offsetting it. So the work done, the impact will be greater and therefore there's a greater potential for erosion as a result of that. So we have stronger grain impacts on the bed and there is science to show that what we call these grain tools uh, are pretty effective and they're a, a major mechanism for, for scour in, in mountain rivers. Another thing is that you know, the, the beds below hydraulic jumps, they could be anything from mud to gravel or bedrock. But no matter what it is, over long periods of time, if you have strong pressure fluctuations as associated with fluctuating air contents, then you're going to start to work apart the bed. Even if it's bedrock, there's joints and fractures. Um, there are tiny particles that are in there um, that can be displaced and so as a result of that it's possible to um, do geomorphic work over time and geology is all about processes acting over long times in a very consistent way so let's take a step back and now think more logically and holistically about mountain rivers and particularly when you have bedrock what are the typical characteristics of these channels well they exhibit geological control, such as you see as these more resistant formations. They're, they could be across the river, they could be going down the river. They're highly non-uniform, so as you move down the river, the topography is changing. Uh, and you can see that not only is it an overall topographic change, but we also have uh, a relatively low ratio of uh, water depth to particle size. For example, in this photo, and even during a flood, even if it's totally inundated, compared to say a flood in the Mississippi River or, or you know a sand grain kind of river, you always have a relatively high roughness of the bed. We have a mixture of what's called supercritical flow and, as you can see, obviously highly aerated flows, and we have processes by which bed load creates incision, which then creates a positive feedback because incision breeds incision. Um, so once you have these tracks along here, then it funnels the sediment into those tracks to do more work. This is an example of those sediment tools I was talking about. So these are some of the things that are going on in mountain rivers that air content could play a role in influencing. Here are photos of two contrasting modes of erosion in mountain rivers. On the left is a highly resistant bedrock river and as a result, its primary mode of erosion is through the development of what are called potholes. Potholes require uh, large sediment grains to scour them out. So sitting on the bottom of here are a whole bunch of particles, probably gravels and cobbles. And when this thing floods, it, it turns this whole bit thing into a drill. And those particles are essentially boring into the, the bed, creating these potholes. Now on the right, is a different case. Here's a case with really, really easily eroded material that's more of a hard pan soil. In this case, tools are not required, and instead we for, formulated um, a multiple horseshoe shape, or what's called a labyrinth shape step. Um, and so over time, one, you know, as water is captured by one of these, then it wins out and it's eroding back further than the others. And this photo was, I think, taken in 2001. By, I think, 2012, maybe, this, uh, this, this uh, larger um, undulation had captured the totality of the flow, and now the whole river right side of this is, is all dried out. So when we think about 
the science of something, we always say, well, what is the reference point for what we already know that we could use to bring to bear on this? We're not going to bring to bear much from our understanding of alluvial rivers because they're fundamentally different and we need to think through what are the processes that would be occurring in bedrock rivers. And one thing that comes to mind is we sure know a lot from engineers about how dams and spillways work. Uh, and here are just three different examples. In the upper right, the broad crested weir, this is a, a, a perfect death machine here in this hydraulic jump. But um, some of the things that are studied about dams and spillways include what is the water surface profile down this? What's the abundance and distribution of energy dissipation? What's the three-dimensional flow structure? Where are the dynamic pressure fluctuations that are occurring along the bed, and how do they change through time and space? What's the force of the jet that's coming over this step and hitting the bed? And what scour depths and patterns exist below, um, below these structures? There's also studies that have been done on alluvial head cuts. So here uh, are settings in a, in a natural uh, logging setting with natural gulling. Uh, and in the upper left, well, this is gulling too, but in an agricultural setting. And so in, in an agricultural setting, you have alluvial sediment, and it too can be affected by what's called a nick point um, or gully or head cut. And so for these, they're moving much, much faster. Of course, you know, these structures aren't moving. So you're studying the stat, well, I don't want to say static, but the, um, the, the dynamics of a system that isn't geomorphically changing, it's, it's fixed, but the hydraulics are not static. Uh, in this case, you have both unsteady hydraulics and geomorphology. So as a result of that, there's more opportunity to study how retreat is taking place. Is it, is it just moving back at the head cut? Is the head cut rotating out of existence? That's what I mean by mode. What's the rate of retreat? What's the role of the cohesion of the bed material? What's the role of discharge and slope? And for any given setting, is there an equilibrium scour depth where you, know, you scour down and as it scours more and more, then the ability to do work diminishes. So there's a negative feedback because it's getting deeper and deeper. And so the impinging jet has less ability to do work. So these are two different analogies for which there already was quite a lot of literature. And we thought about how we could apply those in a mountain river context using the tools that we had. <coughs> so the next step was to conceptualize the problem. Um, so now you can see we're moving from a very specific question that's relatively trivial or, you know, to some people anyway, how, what is the air content in whitewater, to a comprehensive framework for understanding geomorphic change in a mountain river. We can think about basin variables, scaling down to channel variables, all influencing down to an individual step, then what's the role of the shape and size of that step in terms of creating the processes in that step, and then those processes lead, you know, especially hydraulic processes, sediment transport processes, leading to the processes of channel change, what we call morphodynamics. And if we take this overall thing and now build out what do we think is actually going on inside of that, we can get a, a more complicated, more thorough understanding of, the, of how the system works. And, and at this point, I'm not gonna walk through all this, but it's just to illustrate that you begin the science at the holistic scale by conceptualizing the system and then picking individual things to focus on. And so we can focus in this case, if we look at step morphology and step processes, this is where the work was really focusing on. What's the nature of the hydraulic jump regime? Um, the nap is the, the water surface profile over the step. And what are the things that are controlling that? Ultimately, those can then inform how the river is changing. So that led to some specific research questions. And at this point now, the questions are getting very technical. You can see we've gone from something that you could relatively easily relate to, to something where you've got uh, what I would call zombie factor three. And zombie factor is when you're staring at something and you're just like, uh, uh. Yeah, it's starting to get tough. And you're starting to sweat a little bit and figure out, oh my gosh, where's this going? Woo. Uh, but so we can, we can broadly say that we want to understand the systematics of steps. Like for all steps, how are steps organized geomorphically how is energy dissipated in the step? And that then should say something about the role of air content in creating erosion. 
Step dynamics relates to the unique aspects of a particular location um, in terms of understanding the, the local complexity of the processes that are going on um, that aren't necessarily universal, but the questions we can ask about them are universal. So from here, we can rely on what we know from dams, spillways, and alluvial head cuts to go into a little bit of math. And I'm not gonna, now, now we're gonna go to zombie factor four, uh, or for some of you, zombie factor 10, I don't know. But um, the important point here isn't, um, I'm not asking you to understand the mathematics here. It actually isn't that hard, really. Um, but, uh, and tr you know, trust me, because we have no, f we have no differential equations and things like that. But um, we can turn to mathematics in a relatively simplified case, such as a broad crested weir shown here, to think about what the driving variables are and how to set up an experiment to come up with specific tractable scientific hypotheses to advance the research further. Without going, so we, you know, you start from a concept, you move, you move to questions, and then you have to come up with the specific testable hypotheses. Let me just summarize some of the, the essential elements of what matters. The, st the height of the step, so water is going from left to right, and we have a, a rectangular block um, that's blocking the river and creating a step. The step height P is very important, obviously. How much water is going over the step is very important, obviously, and that's represented by capital H, which is the head relative to the datum of the step. And that includes both the pressure head, shown by the solid line, plus the velocity head, because this is moving water, so it actually has a velocity head that wasn't present in the groundwater when, situation when we were deriving hydraulic head. So this is the driving force, and then at the downstream end, you may have an independent tailwater depth, or the tailwater depth may be influenced by the flow. And so, um, you know, what the combination is of flow from the upstream end and tailwater depth on the downstream end are going to influence all the dynamics that are coming on here. So what we want to do is figure out if you put those together, can we solve for things that are going on in the middle, like energy dissipation and hydraulic jump regime. And if we could do that, could we then conduct experiments to really measure what's going on? So on this, on this uh, chart, on the x-axis is energy of the step. And H plus P is our total energy. So you know, like here's P and H. That's the total head, essentially, um, that can drive flow. Uh, and it's normalized by H uh, just to make it non-dimensional. Uh, in this case, because we're normalizing by H, uh, it's both on the top and the bottom, it actually works out that as discharge increases, that the number is trending towards one. So H, you know, because H plus P is always gonna be greater than H, it's bigger, but uh, um, it's representing the transition from uh, generally potential energy on the right at a high value to kinetic energy on the left. Now how that works is, you think about a, a very, imagine a step that's 100 feet high and has one feet of water going in. H plus P would be 101, and H plus, uh, so H plus P is 101 and H is one. So 101 over one would be 101. So a very high waterfall with a tiny amount of water going over it, like Niagara Falls or something, would be way, way off to the right. On the other hand, if you have a huge amount of water going over a very small jet, a small step, it's going to be very close to 1. So this range from 2 to 6 is a dynamic range of relatively you know, high waterfalls to uh, re relatively inundated waterfalls. On the y-axis is the um, you know is the loss that you can see here. So as you go from the potential energy shown by the water surface elevation, this is the combination of head loss and uh, you know the conversion of water from potential energy to kinetic energy represented by velocity. Um, so it's it's a measure of tailwater depth and energy. Well, yeah, of, of, of that. So uh, generally, a very high value would be a, a, a step that has um, no hydraulic jump in the sense that the water comes over the step, ugh, too high, comes over the step, goes down, and then just basically continues on. 
And, you know, so a, a, a full kinetic, uh, high velocity situation. You're taking all the potential energy and you're turning it into kinetic energy and it's just roaring down the river. At a value of zero here, you have a situation where you have kinetic energy, I'm sorry, potential energy here, and then downstream of that, you know, maybe you go over the step, but then you fully recover, or close to fully recover your potential energy. Um, so the difference in elevation from the solid line, the water surface upstream and downstream, that difference there um, represents the difference between having potential energy and kinetic energy, and that's what this uh, left diagram is. Using the equations here, I can solve for the energy and energy loss, and that's what the, the contours are showing here. So forget the coloration and just look at the dark gray contours. This, um, they are the energy dissipation as a function of total energy. So it goes like from, for example, on the right, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. And then the colors represent different hydraulic jump domains where, um, the, I'll show you examples of this, but it's like you know, relatively, um, uh, let's see, a, some, yeah, submerged jump to um, increasingly unsubmerged, and then when you have fruit number of one beyond that, the the water comes over the step and continues on downstream. Um, I think I can show you a video. Actually, sorry, I have to um, back out to. I don't know this video. Uh, oh, no, that's not the video. Wait, let's try this one. Uh, no, this isn't the video either. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a video, but it, it was, I wasn't intending to show it here, so I'll just move on. Um, okay, so ah, getting all messed up now. Sorry, I've like messed the whole thing up. Got my... All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, I tried to do something I shouldn't have. Um, okay, so anyway... Um, I'll be showing you some photos that will illustrate the different states of these hydraulic jumps. So recognizing that theoretically there was this whole domain of different step conditions and potential hydraulic jump and energy dissipation conditions, my goal was not to verify that. My goal was to see what are the processes taking place in these different domains. So to answer that, I stratified my sampling according to these different jump regimes and the different uh, energy, energies that were present there. So I chose what one, two, three, four, five different energy levels, and then I chose to sample within each of these different jump domains. Um, notice I don't have enough sampling here to cover a statistical, you know, robust. Uh, analysis, but because I'm looking at a process-driven thing, I don't need to do that because um, they're so dramatically different between these, and I'm not going to attempt statistical comparisons between them. Um, you can see that I didn't do any sampling in this domain here. It's uh, not, it's, it's basically we just need to be in a good jump condition, and then we want to see when there was no jump present. So we, I got a, I got a grant during, during my first sabbatical in the fall of 2003 from the National Science Foundation through the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics at the University of, of Minnesota. Uh, and they have a facility there called the St. Anthony Falls Lab. They can actually divert part of the Mississippi River through their building and, um, and then do studies with that water. So they have a test channel that's nine feet wide by six feet tall. And with the help of undergraduates and machinists there, we built a broad crested weir with a perfectly semicircular horseshoe brink. So the, and that, that's me standing in the channel for scale. Um, so we built this in here and um, we were able to basically then conduct experiments on a pretty large system. I mean, this is not a, a tiny thing like, this is a really serious hydraulic jump waterfall setup. Uh, and what's even cooler about this is they have a carriage that rolls along here, and I just modified the river truss to, to just need the truss arm and the carriage so I could really accurately measure things uh, over that. And this is a, th in this photo, what you can see is we have water coming over the step, but the tailwater is so high that we're almost completely recovering the potential energy 
So in this case, the hydraulic jump is often thought of as an energy dissipation, but it's really energy recovery. It's recovering kinetic energy in the supercritical zone back to potential energy in the downstream zone. So we did discharges ranging from 13 to 122 CFS. I mean, that's, that's like, you know, it's, that's putting Puda Creek down this test channel, basically. We had a range of test uh, tailwater depths over two orders of magnitude. I was able to measure, of course, the bed topography of the channel one time, but then make three-dimensional maps of the water surface topography with the total station, video the flow patterns, uh, measure the air content patterns with time domain reflectometry, and then measure drag and lift forces with a three-dimensional load cell. And that's, that's a whole other you know, invention, but it's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here. So this shows a photo uh, the condition shown at the very top. So if, if you look at, uh, if you look at, um, I don't know, it's one of these two at the very top, a very high H over P, H plus P over H value, and, and very high H D over H value. Probably says on the photo, um, you know, those, those values here. And you can see that the water comes straight towards the camera. The water goes over the step, plummets almost, you know, like just dropping straight down and it continues on. Although you see some white there, that's just from the splash, there's no hydraulic jump in photo A. There's something called a rooster tail in the middle of the channel. And as because of the horseshoe, the water is crisscrossing, piling up at this rooster tail, crosses over and creates shock waves down the channel. Um, so this, this topographic map C is just turned around view looking downstream of what you see in A, basically. Uh, it's the, the bed topography. So there, there's a high right where all the water comes together, then there's a really big high forming the rooster tail, and then there's a low farther downstream. And then what happened is we just increased the tailwater depth holding discharge constant and saw how we could drown out this feature. And you can see that relatively quick, quickly the rooster tail um, disappears and we get a boil which you can see in the photo B, and then that boil merges in to become a submerged hydraulic jump, um, which, uh, and then, so th those are some low flow examples. Then we just cranked up the discharge and ran it again, and you can see here in the, in the top photo, maintaining supercritical flow throughout, so we could, we can generate the scenarios shown by the mathematical equations. Um, now th there is still rooster tail, although it's not as well defined, uh, and here, I mean, the flow is just ripping. And then here we have a submerged hydraulic jump close to the optimal condition, but definitely somewhat submerged. Uh, you know, this is something where if you fell in, you'd probably die. Um, anyway, and so we were able to map the water surface topography. And here are some just centerline profiles um, that are shown. And I, I I think, uh, let's see, it's probably, yeah, it's for the low, low discharge, high step scenario on the left, high discharge on the right. And so you can see the drop and then how basically we have the two bumps that are there, the, the main rooster tail, how those coalesce and then it flattens out as a submerged hydraulic jump. Whereas, um, you know, for the, for the other scenario, the, the high flow, we do have a rooster tail, but then, you know, look at the, the, the relief of the hydraulic jump near its optimal condition is just, it's pretty extreme. And then, um, and then we get to a submerged hydraulic jump condition. So then we deployed the TDR and did some longitudinal profiles with the TDR. And this just worked fantastically. It was really, uh, got some really spectacular profiles. Here are the same two scenarios. The blue line shows the air content going from zero to 35%. Here the peak was about 30% and then it trails off. This is just in the domain um, from the jump toe, you know, so, so starting uh, the jump toe is where the nap meets the, the ambient um, tailwater. So from there to the top of the hydraulic jump is, is all that that's covering so that we could ha have this scaled on dimension. Of course we went much farther than that, but this is just showing that one piece. And, um, and here it is for the high discharge where we have higher values that are sustained over a longer distance, but it's also for a higher discharge. You could also see the red line which shows the coefficient of variation. That's um, the value divided by the mean of the whole data set. 
And you can see that those tend to be from one to 5% or two to 8%. But the pattern of that mimics the pattern of air content, which means that the highest air content locations have the highest fluctuations in air content. We also did force measurements and just to show you, for example, without getting into the nature of the technology, but like for drag force, um, as you go through to the top from the jump toe to the top of the jump, drag force is increasing in the downstream direction. So the water is going from being jet oriented towards shifting towards moving down the river and therefore having more of a drag component to it. <clears throat> the, um, there's a relatively low coefficient of variation, although it's still 10% of drag force. Um, but these are really high drag forces. And just for reference, if this was out in nature, we would be moving boulders in the one to three meter size range if they were located in here, they would be pushed downstream. <clears throat> then we also measured lift forces. So this is the force of the jet impinging on the bed and then the force resulting from the explosions of water and air uh, downstream of that in the hydraulic jump. Uh, of course, the jet is a, is a downward force hitting the bed, and so you have an, a negative force because it's not going up, but it's still it's the, that jet force. The interesting thing is people have put a lot of stock in the jet and its force, but in fact, you can see here that the lift, lift force under the hydraulic jump is more than twice as strong, almost four times as strong as the jet force. And um, you can also see that the coefficient of variation goes from two to 10. That means that whatever the, the uh, you know, if you have 150 Pascal on average every minute or even every second, every tenth of a second, you can have fluctuations that are double to 10 times that. Which means that, you know, if you have a, a value of, let's just focus on the maximum, like 220, and then you have double that, so you could be going to 440. Uh, it's not as big as the, the drag force, but it's still quite significant. So it's, it's pretty important potential that these forces are there on the bed. And if there's sediment available to do work or if the bed is simply erodible, then that's a lot of hydraulic force to get work done. So some other things then that were done were looking out at a variety of other rivers around the Pacific Northwest and California uh, and new technologies, you know, more mapping of rivers. Uh, but the bottom line is that we were able to develop Fundamentally new technology. I started with a relatively simple question. I mean, let's just be honest, okay? The river stabber, okay? You can just keep laughing at me. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you got to start somewhere. You can't be afraid. And, and I think that's uh, an important part of, of anything is, is having grit and um, trying things that everyone else tells you is stupid and, and a waste of time. I mean, a lot of people were like, and I mean people, I mean like professional scientists, my senior colleagues out in the world were saying, you know, why do you want to measure air content? Who cares? You know, what does this matter? I mean, this research has had a profound influence on the way I think about rivers. I've learned so much, and all of that has translated into what I know about river restoration um, and geomorphic processes. And I've written a lot of journal articles that have been influenced by the ideas that we learn from this work that you just wouldn't know if you hadn't done something really wild and crazy. Um, and so I think there's an important role in science for just play-based uh, research. And then when you do field work, you have to just try things. You have to invent new technologies and think about it in a very creative way. And so hopefully this tries to inspire you to, you know, of course, use traditional methods, but really think outside the box when you can and uh, find new frontiers to go make new discoveries.